mensen met andere, ja, andere ogen naar de wereld laten kijken. Maatschappelijke vraagstukken vanuit verschillende disciplines uh, belichten. Verrassen, verrijken en verbinden. Het verbinden van de wetenschap, de cultuur en de maatschappij. Dat is waar SPUI 25 voor staat. Dat doen wij regelmatig hier in deze grote aula. Maar bijna twee keer per dag door de week dagen in onze zaal hiernaast. Um, nog harder? Oeh, oké. Okay. Luk, lukt het zo? Um, persoonlijk vind ik het altijd heel erg leuk. Oeh, als mensen de zaal niet alleen met antwoorden verlaten, maar ook met nieuwe vragen. Ik ben Barbara Kolen, inhoudelijk leider van SPUI 25. En namens het team heet ik u alle van harte welkom bij de tweede jubileumlezing. SPUI 25 bestaat 15 jaar. We zijn klein begonnen met vier partners. Inmiddels tellen we er 18 en nog tientallen andere organisaties die met regelmaat met ons organiseren. Um, en het 15-jarig jubileum willen wij vieren met vier jubileumlezingen. Normaal hebben we één SPUI 25 lezing zoals deze per jaar. Nu hebben we vier lezingen georganiseerd die weerspiegelen waar wij in onze programmering voor staan en waar we vaak aandacht aan besteden. De aftrap werd gegeven afgelopen mei door de Britse auteur en religiewetenschapper Karen Armstrong. Zij sprak over de heilige natuur. En dat de mens toen zij in de 17e eeuw de natuur en God van elkaar scheiden en zichzelf boven die natuur plaatste, ook eigenlijk daar een legitimatie in zag om, die, om de aarde te plunderen. En haar stelling is, als wij een, de milieuramp willen voorkomen, zullen wij niet alleen ons gedrag moeten veranderen, maar ook anders moeten gaan denken en voelen uh, over onze natuurlijke omgeving. En dat was de afgelopen jaren een steeds groter thema bij SPUI 25. Hoe verhouden wij ons tot de aarde, tot het niet-menselijke, tot niet-menselijke dieren? Um, dus dat was de eerste lezing. Vandaag staan we hier voor A.M. Holmes, een uh, gerenommeerde Amerikaanse schrijfster die het gaat hebben onder meer over de rol van de schrijver in de samenleving en hoe je via fictie de ander kunt proberen te begrijpen. En zij treedt in een lange reeks van SPUI 25 schrijvers die hier door de jaren hebben gestaan. De afgelopen twee jaar door corona hadden we geen grote internationale gast, maar een thematisch programma. Maar nu kunnen we eindelijk weer voort op die lijn. Op uh, 8 november is er de derde jubileumlezing en dan komt Andrea Wolf. Velen van u zullen haar kennen als de biograaf van Alexander van Humboldt. En zij komt ons vertellen uh, over het bonte gezelschap Briljante Geesten. Uh, uh, genie noemt zij het, zoals Goethe, Hegel, Schiller, ook Alexander van Humboldt. Die eind 18e eeuw in het uh, Duitse plaatje Jena op radicaal andere wijze gingen nadenken over het zelf. En het ik eigenlijk bombardeerde tot centrum van ons wereldbeeld. Deze, dat was ook een hele bijzondere lezing. En deze eerste drie die vatten heel goed samen wat veel mensen van Spaar 25 kennen, namelijk uh, de literatuur, de geesteswetenschappen. Maar wij zijn een interdisciplinair podium en ook steeds meer geworden. Dus inmiddels hebben de beta-wetenschappen ook een stevige positie in onze programmering. En het mooie is dat in deze tijd je ziet dat uh, de geesteswetenschappen en de beta-wetenschappen elkaar ook steeds meer raken en inspireren. En onze vierde jubileumlezing op 14 november hebben wij daarom de bioloog um, Merlin Sheldrake uitgenodigd. Mogelijk kent, uh, kent u hem. Hij heeft het baanbrekende boek Verweven Leven geschreven over het fascinerende leven van schimmels. En hoezeer zij het leven op aarde bepalen. En dit boek zet echt heel veel concepten op zijn kop. Autonomie, intelligentie. Het, het, wordt een, het wordt een rollercoaster met hem. En het mooie is dat je ziet dat zijn boek ook heel veel filosofen, maar ook dichters heeft geïnspireerd. En om ons jubileum dus in november af te sluiten, komt er ook een heel bijzonder optreden van niemand minder dan Ramzi Nasser, acteur, auteur, dichter, die geïnspireerd door het boek van Merlin Sheldrake gedichten heeft gemaakt over het kleinste leven. En dat wordt, gaat hij opvoeren met het uh, rietquintet Kalefax, bij sommigen ook heel bekend. Um, en dat wordt een, een waanzinnige afsluiting van onze jubileumviering. 
Deze thema's geven een beetje aan wat wij dagelijks in de zaal doen, maar daar behandelen natuurlijk veel meer onderwerpen. En zo'n grote programmering met zo'n divers aanbod kunnen wij alleen maar dankzij onze partners. Spui 25 heeft, zoals ik al zei, inmiddels 18. Als het goed is, komen ze zo hier op het scherm. Want uh, voorheen konden we ze nog wel opnoemen, maar dat was een te lange lijst. Oh, ik mag zelf klikken. Zo leer je iedere keer iets. Nou, dan zie je dat het er heel veel zijn, cultureel en academisch. En het is belangrijk om te uh, weten dat bij de Universiteit van Amsterdam, daar schuilen uh, wel elf of twaalf partners achter, vijf faculteiten, uh, bureau communicatie. Het is een, uh, een ongelooflijk belangrijke partner. En wij zijn heel blij dat jullie er allemaal zijn, ook onze partners, want zonder jullie konden wij dit niet doen. Uh, Dank je wel. Ook het team wil ik bedanken, want ik sta hier nou, maar ik sta voor een klein maar heel gedreven team. En eigenlijk zou ik ze, ik, als ik wist dat ze het niet zouden verschrikkelijk vinden, zou ik ze op het podium willen halen om een heel groot applaus te geven. Want zij zijn diegenen die die 250 tot 300 programma's per jaar opzetten. Dus jullie ook, dank je wel waar jullie overal zitten. Ik ga zo dadelijk plaatsmaken hier voor Margot Dijkgraaf. Uh, zij gaat E.M. Holmes introduceren en interviewen. Uh, zij is een, een benaderd literatuurcriticus, met name van Franse en Nederlandse literatuur. Heeft heel veel boeken geschreven, waaronder zijn namen het woord rebelse schrijvers in de Franse letteren en in de voetsporen van mijn vader, wat onlangs is genomineerd voor de Zeeuwse Boekenprijs. En vorig jaar... Uh, kreeg zij de, de illustere Gouden Ganzenveer vanwege haar grote rol als sensibele en erudite ambassadeur van de letteren. Maar ook Margot uh, wil ik graag uh, hartelijk bedanken, want zij stond aan de wieg van Spui 25 en heeft het de eerste zeven jaar als directeur groot gemaakt. Dus zonder haar had ik niet zo'n fantastische baan en zaten jullie niet allemaal hier. <lacht> Margot, ik wil nou aan jou de vloer geven en ik wil jullie allemaal een hele fijne avond wensen. En na de lezing van E.M. Holmes zal zij signeren hier, maar er is een borrel in de zaal om het hoekje. En daar willen we heel graag met jullie allemaal het glas heffen op nog 15 jaar spui 25. Thank you very much, Barbara. Where are you? Are you all ready? Yeah, there you are. And first of all, of course, my, my really warm congratulations to, to you and to all your colleagues at SPAU 25. Indeed, I'm one of the very proud mothers of uh, the Academic Cultural Center SPAU 25, so I'm very happy. It is now a real inquisitive adolescent, actually, becoming a very interesting adult. And I thought the applause was a little bit meager, so I would like to have an, a very warm, big applause. Yes! <laughs> Two weeks ago, I listened to Francis Fukuyama in the Dutch television program Buitenhof. Maybe you have seen it also. The famous political philosopher said that there is a real possibility that in two years' time, Donald Trump will be re-elected as president of the US. When Fukuyama was asked whether the, he thought that democracy was at stake, he said, yes, one third of the Americans believe that the last election was stolen, based, of course, on a total lie concocted by Trump who encouraged his armed supporters to storm the Capitol on January 6th. It was an attempted violent coup d'etat, he said, and they are trying to do that again. They are putting officials in place to manipulate the counting of votes in 2024. The basic democratic institution is under threat. End of quote. That, of course, was a very impressive statement. 
Then I remembered a recent article I read in the Washington Post, written by Robert Kagan, in which he stated that the United States are heading into its greatest political and constitutional crisis since the Civil War. There is, he wrote, a reasonable chance over the next three to four years that we will see incidents of mass violence and a breakdown of federal authority and a division of the country into warring red and blue enclaves. Trump will be the Republican candidate for president in 2024, he wrote, and he and his Republican allies are actively preparing to ensure his victory by whatever means necessary. When I read A.M. Holmes' most recent novel, The Unfolding, I thought this is an important, very important book. It is a political, satirical, funny, and sometimes moving novel in which the author explains to us in a very clear, open, and convincing way what has been happening in the US since the election of Barack Obama in 2008. In her novel, A.M. Holmes shows us how the country has become what it has become now, how the liberal democracy in the US has been undermined, and it underlines that this has been going on for a long time. The unfolding is, for me, an excellent example of what the novel can do, what its strength can be. Often, fiction moves us more than scientific studies, more than investigative journalism, no matter how well these are written. It comes with identification, suspense, and emotions. In her novel, A.M. Holmes shows us the power of her writing. Holmes, of course, is the author of an impressive oeuvre of novels and short stories, who writes scenarios for television and teaches in the creative writing program at Princeton University. Recently, we read in the media about books which are banned from American schools and libraries. According to Pan America, there were about 1,500 book bans in 86 school districts across 26 states, affecting more than 2 million students. Stories featuring LGBTQ plus issues or protagonists were a major target of bans, while other targets included books with storylines about race and racism, sexual content or sexual assault, and death and grief. How would a writer like A.M. Holmes, author of The End of Alice, react to that, I thought? I remembered her novel The End of Alice, published in 1996. It is the story of a middle-aged pedophile and murderer who is in prison, serving a life sentence, and his correspondence with a strange, quite morbid young woman. I remembered the perversity of the characters, the courage it must have taken to write the book, and the way the novel was criticized then, when it came out, 25 years ago. I also remembered A.M. Holmes' impressively honest bestseller, The Mistress's Daughter, a memoir in which she tells her readers that she was given up for adoption before she was born. In the book, she describes what happened when her birth mother came looking for her many years later. The book was a research, an examination of what identity means and at the same time, a sharp analysis of what a family can be or not be. Family, as many of you know, of course, is a big theme in nearly all Holmes' novels and short stories. In her book, May, be, May We Be Forgiven, life is a chaos, 
and families are not a solution. They are, on the contrary, in most cases, the source of it all. Most of the time, real contact with the other, family or not, is impossible. You never really get to know your brother, your sister, or your friend. On the contrary, often Holmes draws us to a world of misunderstanding, adultery, loss, grief, or absurdity. In her recent short story collection, Days of Awe, translated by Gerda Bartman and Monique Terberg as Dagen van Inkeer, in this short story collection, we meet, for instance, a cosmetic surgeon who is injecting his own face with filler in the bathroom, a war correspondent and a lesbian novelist sleeping with each other at the summit on genocide, a young woman on the couch of a psychiatrist with an obsession for roses and thorns, a young father who goes to Disneyland all alone, all by himself, in order to look for the last day he was happy in his life. And we meet a baby found in the supermarket, put in a trolley, as if it were a tube of toothpaste. In short, characters in sometimes unlikely, uncomprehensible and uneasy, strange or even magical situations. That is why Holmes's work never leaves you indifferent. It challenges you to think, to think out of the box, to discuss all kinds of topics. And of course, for all these reasons, I'm very grateful to Spuy 25 for having invited M. Holmes to give the Spuy 25 lecture today. And of course, I'm very much looking forward to listening to her and to talk with her on the role of the writer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margo, for that incredibly beautiful introduction. I have no words. Uh, it is really, really a treat to be here. Uh, I'm so grateful to all of the sponsors on page three, <laughs> um, uh, to my wonderful longtime publishers, and it's just, it's, it's, it's odd to say, it's great to be out of America for a minute. Oh my God, I can breathe. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the role of a writer, the writer, a writer. I guess it's me, actually, I'm going to talk to you about. Um, in some ways, I think I'm the least likely person to talk about myself because I don't really write that much about myself, but I'm going to try. Um, I will say that in my regular life, this is me jumping in now with the glasses on, I'm a lecturer at Princeton University, and so it is through the lens of both an educator and author that I will be talking about the ways in which my work exists, and I think it exists both to document and illuminate what is beneath the surface of our public and private lives on both the large scale in terms of the American socio-political world and the more intimate domestic landscape of family life. I think of myself as someone who operates as an observer, a witness, and a self-described psychological anthropologist. I don't even know what that means. I'm also fascinated by the imagination, and I do believe that it is the most important tool, not just in the artist's kit, but for the average citizen. Albert Einstein, who admittedly I'm in love with, also taught at Princeton, and he once said, imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited to all that we know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world and all there ever will be to know and understand. And you may ask, why Einstein? And I will say that it, I think of Einstein as someone who was willing to play and to experiment and to depart the known, to take risk and to fail. And also in his recognition of the interrelatedness of art and science, I firmly believe that in order to do something new, one first has to fail. One doesn't succeed at substantial scale without taking risk. And that's not just in art, but in life. And at Princeton, my students have worked so hard to get there and they're expert test takers. I wanna say your homework is due on Thursday. They say, what time? They are risk averse, and that's how they got to Princeton, by following rules and being good test takers. So what do I teach them? Do I teach them to write? Can anyone teach anyone to write? No. 
I teach them to think, to daydream, to tap into their imaginations. I teach mess making and failure. I teach them to take risk and expand not knowing where things will lead. My plan for tonight is to talk about how I came to do this work and read to you some examples from the work so you can see the ways in which the ideas are expressed in fiction. Uh, just so you know what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to read to you from three excerpts during the course of uh, this talk. The first will be from a short story called A Real Doll. First, a technical adjustment. Apparently, I'm playing a playlist of tunes from, who's Adam and your iPod is, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> exactly. Oh, there we go. Oh. Does anyone have a pen so I can put a mustache? Or like Donald Trump, I could just draw like the bad map. Remember when he did that? Okay. So the first thing I'll read to you will be from the, A Real Doll, which is the story about a Barbie doll that I wrote when I was in my early 20s. And then later, a little excerpt from Days of Awe, which was the story about the Holocaust that was from a few years ago, and finally from the new novel, The Unfolding. So where to begin in terms of what is a writer's job and a writer's responsibility? Well, a writer must reflect on and interpret his society, his world. I don't know why I'm using the word his, but there it is. He must also provide inspiration, guidance, and challenge. For me, it is also like being an explorer. It allows me to literally walk in the shoes of another. It pushes me to find understanding and articulation for what I see happening around me, what I find disturbing or confusing that needs further investigation. When it's at its best, it can be a bit like time travel, taking me beyond the barriers of everyday existence and into a world of infinite possibility. One of my favorite teachers was the American writer and activist Grace Paley, and she was often asked what the social responsibility of a writer is, and her answer was always that the writer has the same responsibility as a plumber, to simply do their job as best as possible, no more or less. Now, Grace wanted to make clear that a writer was a worker and not an elevated figure in any way. And I agree with that, but I also do feel that the artist has a unique position. I do feel that the arts capture a kind of experience that is different than that of a journalist or documentarian. The arts capture the psychological, the emotional, the sort of invisible ether of a time. And to that end, I feel a need to create work which entertains as it captures the moment, but also which provokes conversation and debate. I would never presume to tell a reader what to think or believe, but I would rather the reader ask questions of himself and the world around him. I see the work as a mirror, which reflects us back to ourselves, and in that reflection, sometimes one sees something differently than they had at first glance. So where do these things begin? Well, at home, of course. The contradictions in my work are very evident in my own life from the very beginning. I grew up as an adopted person in Washington, D.C., as you all know, Washington is a very political town, and yet my family were socialists. They were socialists who somehow managed to have enough money to build a modernist glass house. But they also believed we should not eat grapes because they were not picked by union workers. We should not eat lettuce for the same reason. We definitely should not go on vacation because other people were suffering somewhere. And we shouldn't buy toys because they were part of consumerist culture. We could go to museums or historical sites. You could go to a health food store, and you could get anything in the museum gift shop because it was somehow educational and important. It also meant that there was a problem with the Barbie doll. It also means I have different page numbers. Ah. The problem with the Barbie is... I know. I printed this out multiple times today. I'm sure it's here somewhere. Okay, well, anyway, the problem, I can tell you exactly what the problem with the Barbie doll was. The problem with the Barbie doll was that she looked like a grown woman, but she was 12 inches tall. And that was not considered a good toy for little girls because it made them think that all grown women had enormous breasts and tiny waists and really long legs, and you should not ever play with a Barbie. Uh, and also, touching a Barbie was weird because everybody, the whole game of Barbie was dressing and undressing Barbie to go on dates. And that was not really appropriate for five-year-olds. So uh, I had no Barbie. I had a lot of plain paper and crayons because that was an appropriate toy in my family. Um, I think it was also cheap, but that's okay. Anyway, so then I went to graduate school and the, the, the punishment of no Barbie, not really, I'm kidding, but there was a story that came out called Dating Your Mom by a writer named Ian Fraser in The New Yorker. And somehow thinking of the idea of dating your mom, which seemed to me like comic and light, made me think about this Barbie doll. So I went to the local toy store in Iowa City, Iowa, which is right in the middle of the country, and it's actually called the City of Iowa City, Iowa, which you can work with that. 
and I bought a Barbie doll. But interestingly, they didn't have a big selection, so they only had a Barbie doll that was called My First Barbie, and she was wearing a white dress, and it said, Now with Bigger Buttons, which I think meant it was easier for little kids to undress Barbie because the little buttons were hard for their fingers to work. But I took it to also mean Virgin Barbie, because it was just weird, the white dress, the whole thing. So I bring the Barbie home to my apartment in Iowa City, and I put it up on the mantle, and then all of a sudden I turn into like a psychoanalyst, because every person who comes in, male, female, anywhere in between, immediately goes over and takes Barbie's clothes off. And I'm thinking, that's not nice. <laughs> what are you doing? And then they would tell me things. They would tell me that their sister used to stick pins in Barbie's head to make earrings and other, they would burn her feet. I'm like, that's a witch. I mean, so. I started thinking about what is this toy? And I will say one of my strategies as a writer that I started fairly early on was picking what I would call the least likely character to tell the story. So that meant in this case, who better slash worse to talk about sort of Barbie and her sexuality than the adolescent brother of Barbie's owner. So I will read to you now a little bit. And, and the things I will read to you from the stories are very much edited. So if you're liking it a little bit, actually read the whole thing and you'll get it. Okay. And this was written when I was in my very early 20s. And so part of what I want to talk about tonight, and which you did so beautifully, Margot, in the introduction, the arc of how already I'm looking at sort of social cultural themes, very much also using comedy, but also how I like to believe that developed and got more serious <laughs> over the years till right now, which we're on the cusp of civil war, if, you know. Okay. <laughs> a real doll. I'm dating Barbie. Three afternoons a week while my sister is at dance class, I take Barbie away from Ken. I'm practicing for the future. At first, I sat in my sister's room watching Barbie, who lived with Ken, on a doily on top of the dresser. I was looking at her, but not really looking. I was looking and all of a sudden realized she was staring at me. She was sitting next to Ken, his khaki-covered thigh absently rubbing her bare leg. He was rubbing her, but she was staring at me. Hi, she said. Oh, hello, I said. I'm Barbie, she said, and Ken stopped rubbing her leg. I know. You're Jenny's brother, I nodded. My head was bobbing up and down like a puppet on a weight. I really like your sister. She's sweet, Barbie said, and such a good little girl, and especially lately, she makes herself so pretty, and she started doing her nails. I wondered if Barbie noticed that Miss Wonderful bit her nails, and that when she smiled, her front teeth were covered with little flecks of purple nail polish. I wondered if she knew that Jennifer colored in the chip chewed spots with purple magic marker and then sometimes sucked on her fingers, so not only did she have purple flecks of polish on her teeth, but her tongue was a stranger shade of violet. So uh, listen, I said to Barbie, would you like to go out for a while, grab some fresh air, maybe take a spin around the old backyard? Sure, she said. I picked her up by her feet. It sounds unusual, but I was too petrified to take her by the waist. I grabbed her by the ankles and carried her off like a popsicle stick. As soon as we were out back, sitting on the porch of what I used to call my fort, but which my sister and parents referred to as the playhouse, I started freaking. I was suddenly and incredibly aware that I was out with Barbie. I didn't know what to say. So, uh, what kind of Barbie are you? I asked. Excuse me? Well, you know, from listening to Jennifer, I know there's day to night Barbie, magic moves Barbie, gift giving Barbie, tropical Barbie, my first Barbie, and more. I'm tropical, she said. I'm tropical, she said, the same way a person might say I'm Catholic or I'm Jewish. I came with a one-piece bathing suit, a brush, and a ruffle you can wear so many ways. I nodded. Do you have a sister? Skipper, Barbie squeaked. She actually squeaked. It turned out that squeaking was Barbie's birth defect, and I pretended I didn't hear it. Does Jennifer have her too? No, Barbie said. She still lives with my mom and dad. I couldn't mar imagine Barbie having been born, much less having parents. We were quiet for a minute, and a leaf larger than Barbie fell from the maple tree above us, and I caught it just before it would have hit her. I half expected her to squeak, You've saved my life. I'm yours forever. Instead, she said in a perfectly normal voice, Wow, big leaf. We sat looking at each other, looking and talking and then not talking and looking again. It was a stop and start kind of thing with both of us constantly saying the wrong thing, saying anything, and then immediately regretting having said it. It was obvious Barbie didn't trust me, I asked her if she wanted something to drink. Diet Coke, she said, and I wondered why I'd asked. I went upstairs into the house to my parents' bathroom and opened the medicine cabinet and got a couple of Valium. I immediately swallowed one. If we could be calm and collected, she'd realize I wasn't going to hurt her. 
I broke another volume into a million small pieces and dropped some into her Diet Coke and swished it so it would blend. If we were calm and collected together, she'd trust me even sooner. So what's the deal with you and Ken, I asked, after she'd loosened up, after we had two Diet Cokes and I'd made another trip to the medicine cabinet. Oh, we're really just good friends, she said. But what's the deal with him, really? You can tell me. Is he or isn't he? Is he or isn't he, Barbie said in a slow, slurred way, like she was so intoxicated that if they made a breathalyzer for Valium, she'd melt it. He lusts after me, she said. I come at home at night, and he's standing there waiting. Ken doesn't wear underwear, you know. I mean, isn't that strange? He doesn't own any underwear. I heard Jennifer tell her friend they don't even make underwear for him. Anywhere, he's always there waiting, and I'm like, Ken, we're friends, okay, that's it. Have you ever noticed he has molded plastic hair? His head and his hair are all one piece. I can't go out with a guy like that. She was telling me things I didn't think I should hear, and all the same, I was leaning into her, like if I moved closer, she'd tell me more. I was taking in every word and holding it for a minute, hoping groups of words in my head like I didn't understand English. She went on and on, but I wasn't listening. The sun sank behind the playhouse, and on the way back to Jennifer's room, I did something Barbie almost didn't forgive me for. I did something which not only shattered the moment, but which nearly wrecked the possibility of our having a future together. In the hallway between the stairs and Jennifer's room, I popped Barbie's head into my mouth like lion and tamer, God and Godzilla. I popped her whole head into my mouth, and Barbie's hair separated into single strands like Christmas tinsel and caught in my throat, nearly choking me. I could taste layer on layer of makeup, Revlon, Max Factor, and Maybelline. I closed my mouth around Barbie, and I could feel her breath in mine. I could hear her screams in my throat. I bit my tongue in the inside of my cheek like I might accidentally... She bit my tongue in the inside of my te- cheek like I might accidentally bite myself. I closed my ra- mouth around Barbie's neck and held her suspended, her feet uselessly kicking the air in front of my face. Before pulling her out, I pressed my teeth lightly into her neck, leaving Mark's Barbies described as scars of her assault, but I imagined as a new age necklace of love. I have never, ever been treated with such utter disregard, she said as soon as I let her out. She was lying. I knew Jennifer sometimes did things with Barbie. I didn't mention that once I'd seen Barbie hanging from Jennifer's ceiling fan, spinning around in great wide circles like an imitation Superman. I'm sorry if I scared you. Scared me, scared me. Barbie was squeaking louder and louder until finally she had my attention again. Have you ever been held captive in the dark cavern of someone's body? I shook my head. It sounded wonderful. Typical, she said. So incredibly typically male. And for a moment, I was proud. Why do you have to do things you shouldn't? And worse yet, you do them with this light in your eye, like you're getting some weird pleasure out of it that only another boy would understand. You're all the same, she said. You're all Jack Nicholson. So that's just the little clip of that one. So that's when I was young. <laughs> Things only went weird. <laughs> Thank you for a second. <laughs> Things only went weirder from there. So if that was the stuff of childhood, which we will talk about, I'm sure, uh, I guess I grew up and I wrote more short stories and novels, including the very famous End of Alice about the jailed pedophile murderer, which the idea was to talk about why in society, we do such a bad job dealing with the sexual abuse of children. And, and the, one of the most upsetting things in the very upsetting book is when the jailed pedophile murderer says, if I'm in jail, why is it still happening? Which is him turning it back on us as society. And I guess increasingly, despite Grace Paley saying that we only had to do as good as plumbers, I began to feel that I had to do something more and, and that I had to be writing about things that talked about sort of the fiber of society, and not only sort of our responsibility to history and to tell the stories that hadn't been told or had been left out, but also to talk about our responsibilities to each other. So that brings us to the second question of the night for me, which is the question of who has the right to tell a story. And this has come up a lot lately. And the idea is, does a person have to have lived something themselves in order to write about it? So traditionally in writing classes, they would say, write what you know. And I think, well, I'd run out. You know, I don't know that much. I have, I'm not that interesting in and of myself. Um, and I would say that the, the work of a fiction writer is to inhabit the other. But there is a lot of debate because there are a lot of people who feel that the marginalization and absence of some cultures from the voices of fiction, that those voices and cultures have the right and the need to tell their own stories first. And I would say that's complicated. And I absolutely do believe that it's important for each of us to have our voices 
and to be able to share our experiences. And, but I don't believe we should stop writing fiction. Um, so that brings me to the book of stories called The Days of Awe. And one of the stories in that book that is the title story is concerned with the Holocaust and the way in which one must attend to history even as those who survived are now dying off. And we have very few people left to tell the story and it circles back to the idea, does something have, hap have to have happened to you in order for you to be able to tell it? Um, so, in this story, The Days of All, we meet a novelist and a journalist who hook up, not really a word I've ever used, um, at a Holocaust conference, which is pretty weird. And they also, as this is happening, besides hooking up, they discover parts of themselves that they've been disconnected from, including their own Jewish history. So I'm going to read you a little bit from that story, which is right here. See reference 7B. No, I'm just kidding. This is the most organized I've ever been in my entire life because it really doesn't go like this. Okay, so this again is a, oh, who's that? Um, a clip. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> There's a running joke, which I, I, I'll only tell you the running joke and not the whole thing. So when I was writing, I guess it was one of the last books, um, they, I think it was, was it May We Be Forgiven? I'd been alone in the house for so long. I was like, I've got to do something. I've got to get out of here. And so I thought I should take a course somewhere. And I signed up somehow for stand-up comedy. Okay, so I signed up for the stand-up comedy class, not realizing that I qualify for diversity in two levels. One is that apparently old people don't take stand-up comedy and women don't take stand-up comedy. But there was one bad, bad side effect, which was then on the book tour that followed my finishing the novel, every time I screwed up the reading of something, I would lapse into stand-up comedy. And it made it very worrisome for my publishers and things, because they were like, what is going to happen now? And I was like, I don't know. Um, it's not going to happen now. Days of Awe. He is the war correspondent. She is the transgressive novelist. They have been flowed in for the summit on genocides. Every time she says yes to these things, conferences, readings, guest lectures, it's because she hasn't learned to say no. And she has the misguided fantasy that time away from home will allow her to think, to get something done. She has brought work with her, the short story she can't finish, the novel that's incomplete, the friend's book that needs a blurb, last Sunday's newspaper. He stands at the reception desk. The thick curls that he long ago kept short are receding, and in compensation they're longer and more unruly. Funny seeing you here, he says. Is it? He makes her uncomfortable, uncharacteristically shy. She wonders how he looks so good. She glances down. Her blouse is heavily wrinkled, while his shirt is barely creased. So did you fly in from a war zone, she asks. Washington, he says. There was a press club dinner last night, and the day before I was in Geneva, and before that, the war. Quite a slide from there to here, she says. Not really. No matter how nice the silverware is, it's still a rubber chicken. She knew him long ago before either of them had become anyone. They were part of a group fresh out of college, working in publishing that met regularly at a bar. He was deeply serious, a permanently furrowed brow, and he was married. That was the funny thing. They all talked about it behind his back. Who was married at 23? No one ever saw the wife. That's what they called her, the wife. Even now, she doesn't know her name. An older man approaches the war correspondent. Very big fan, the man says, resting his hand on the correspondent's shoulder. I have a story for you about a trip my wife and I went on, the man clears his throat. We were in Germany and decided to visit the camps. We got to our hotel and I asked, how do we get there? They tell us you take a train and then a bus and when you arrive there'll be someone there to lead you. We go. It's terrifying. All I can think of as the train goes clackety-clack is that these are the same rails that took my family. We get to the camp. There's a cafe and a bookstore selling postcards, and we don't know what to think. And then, when we get back to the hotel, the young German girl at the desk looks at us with a big smile and says, Do you, did you enjoy your visit to Dachau? Do we laugh or cry? The man pauses. So what do you think? The war correspondent nods. It's hard to know, isn't it? We did both, the man says. We laugh, we cried, and we're never going back. The correspondent catches her eye and smiles. There are delightful creases by his eyes that weren't there years ago. She's annoyed. Why is his smile so quick, so perfect? As she moves towards the elevator, a conference volunteer catches her arm. Don't forget your welcome bag. The volunteer hands her a canvas toast laden with genocide swag. 
She goes straight to her room and puts the do not disturb sign on the door and locks it. Do you ever go off duty? She hears her therapist's voice asking, not really. She thinks of her therapist. She has the opposite of transference. She never wishes the therapist were her mother or her lover. She thinks of the therapist and is relieved not to be married or related to her. She secretly thinks the therapist is a passive aggressive bully and perhaps she should have been a lawyer. You wrote an exceptionally strong book illustrating multi-generational effects of Holocaust trauma. You knew there would be questions. She hears the therapist's voice loud and clear in her head. It's a novel. I made it up. You created characters, but the emo emotional truths are very real. There are different kinds of knowing. Silence. You spent years inhabiting the experience on every level. Remember when you starved yourself? When you drank tainted water? When you didn't bathe for 30 days? Yes, but I was not in the Holocaust. I'm an imposter. The critics made that quite clear. The therapist clucks and shakes her head, and she wonders, aren't therapists trained not to cluck? Critics aren't the same as readers, and your readers felt that you gave language and illumination to a very difficult aspect of their experience. You won an international award. I find it interesting that you have to do this, the therapist says. Do what? Undermine yourself. Because I'm better at it than anyone else, she glances up smiling. The therapist has the sad face on. At least I'm honest, she says. Still the sad face. Really, she asks. Really, the therapist said. She said yes to the genocide conference after having made a pact with herself to say no to everything, a move towards getting back to work on a new book. She'd spent the better part of a year on book tour traveling the world and giving readings, doing interviews, answering questions that felt like interrogations. It was as if the journalist thought by asking often enough and in enough languages, eventually something would fall out, some admission, some other story. But in fact, there was nothing more. She'd put all she had to say into the book. So that... There goes that chapter of life. I've run out of notes. No kidding. <laughs> um, somewhere they're here. So that brings us up to not now, because this book, the, the new book, The Unfolding, which is what I'm going to talk about now, took a mere 10 years to write. And everyone keeps asking me, what else were you doing? I'm like, I was busy. Um, I wrote a couple of operas during that time, I raised a family, and I did a lot of research for this book. So the book, The Unfolding, in part started with the idea I had, I know it's not a really, I always, for me, fiction comes from what I would call non-fiction. So I'm always literally reading the culture and reading the society, and I start to see things, and it, that doesn't make me a psychic, it just means I'm, like, paying attention. Um, yeah, which is, okay, I'm not gonna, don't digress. So I, I start to see things, <laughs> and um, I started to feel that the American political establishment, all sides, was no longer in touch with the American voter, that the political system had become sort of a, a thing that was serving itself and not representing the people who were voting anymore. Um, and there also, that dovetailed with what we begin to call the rise of dark money. So in 2008, if you gave $100,000 to a campaign, that bought you a lot of influence, a lot. Um, there's a huge article actually in today's New York Times talking about a man named Leonard Leo who runs what we call the Federalist Society. That's the group on the far right that have been putting all these judges on. They recently gave a gift of $1.8 billion. That's a lot. You can buy countries for that actually. Um, so that rise of that money which is not traceable and can buy obviously advertising and campaigns. We also are at a, an interesting moment where language and words that used to have a common meaning, like democracy was one of our basic ones that we all thought, oh, we live in a democracy. That now means different things to different people. So I started thinking about that quite a long time ago, and I had the feeling that started to happen, and there's actually a story in the book Days of Awe called A Prize for Every Player that was the first time I played with this, and that's the one where a family goes and does its shopping in a big box store, which is like a, you know, a store that has everything, including caskets, not making it up, um, they also find a baby when they're there, and by the time they're done shopping, the other shoppers have nominated the father to run for president because they feel like he actually reflects their points of view. So that was my beginning to test drive this idea. And then I guess I looked back and I saw that when there had been a previous election that we sort of forgot about, where I went to bed thinking Al Gore had won and I woke up and George Bush was president. 
not a good night, right, <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's like, I should have had nightmares, you know what I mean? So in that situation, it turned out that Florida had this thing called a hanging chad, which is a little piece of paper, and they had control of Florida, and so they were able to sort of claim the election. And that was a big moment for them, and sort of rem remains dormant in our history until we get to where we are now, but just hold that thread. So when Obama won, um, what I noticed was a moment that I had bought a new TV. I went from my college TV to a bigger one. I invited friends over. I was in New York City, and people poured down into the streets when Obama won. It was a moment for many of us of elation and hope and the idea that there was about to be a new iteration of America and a version of the dream that could be shared by people of different colors and different backgrounds and different economic statuses and so on. But what also happened then was sort of the trip off of a kind of racism and sexism that has been all the time always underneath the surface. And that has continued to bubble louder and louder and louder up through Donald Trump and you know, one of the biggest expressions of it recently was the clawback of Roe versus Wade or women's rights to make choices about abortion and so on. So somehow I, it's weird, I sound like, a, I, don't, I, I could be a prophet. <laughs> or maybe I'm just doing this for prophet, no, anyway. Um, but I, I saw that this, there really was this thing happening. It was very disturbing to me. So I wanted to look at the, the, this group of men known as the Forever Men, um, self-appointed group, that begin to try to think about how do they reclaim their version of democracy. And their version of democracy goes back to the idea, basically, that white men who own land should vote, and probably no one else. And even though this is not overtly talked about in America, there is a lot of effort made to either not count votes, not let people vote. It's, it is not a particularly fair or free system. So I wanted to look at that. I also wanted to look at... Um, the, the lives of a family, and I, you know, we don't see the wealthy right represented in literature. I don't really know why that is. We see them as sort of hillbillies or downtrodden, but I wanted to sort of look at that and see what that looked like, and this again is my way of sort of picking the least likely person to begin to take me on this journey. So we have the big guy, his group of friends called the Forever Men, and then his wife Charlotte, who is an alcoholic, in line with along the lines of uh, Martha Mitchell, the wife of Attorney General John Mitchell during Nixon, Pat Nixon, uh, Betty Ford, so a long tradition in America of political al alcoholic wives, uh, keeping secrets for the family. Um, I also see her really as a cross between Joan Didion and Nancy Reagan, but we can talk about that later. Um, and then sh their daughter, Megan, who votes for the first time, and that was very important to me because I needed to have there be some prospect of hope, and, and the realization that we all go through, a sort of universal thing, as you grow up, you begin to differentiate yourself from your family, and, and whatever that narrative is, that family story, and begin to think, oh, do I have thoughts of my own? So Megan votes for the first time in a scene that's meant to sort of echo Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, where things seem really banal and simple, and then they just become increasingly menacing. And so it is the story of the big guy and his cohort, and then really the coming of to consciousness of Charlotte and Megan. So I'm going to read you a little bit from some, somewhere near the opening of the book, and this is a scene that takes place, and again, it's compressed and edited, but they are at uh, the, the hotel in Phoenix, Arizona, hoping that they will be celebrating John McCain's victory, and, and in this scene you will see the big guy, Megan, and Charlotte, and it's just a little feel for it, and then we can talk about all the fun things we want to talk about. The Unfolding. Her father has a schedule of parties. It's like trick-or-treating. You go from party to party, and as they progress, the snacks get fancier, the crowd gets smaller, the rooms get nicer, and the flower arrangements multiply. At every stop, her mother heads for the bar. Vodka with soda on the rocks. Her mother takes a piece of crudité from a sculpture. Have this, it'll keep you occupied and away from the penis nuts, Megan says. Her mother smiles. Penis nuts. That's what her mother calls the communal bowls of nuts. There are things that one teaches a young girl. Never eat the penis nuts. Men don't wash their hands after they use the facilities. If you must eat, take something that's sticking straight up, celery or a carrot, but God forbid don't dip it in anything. That's the other weak spot, the double dippers. John's here, someone says. At the party? God, no, he's upstairs. He's arrived. I still feel sorry for Cindy, a woman says. It's hard to be the wife. Jewel of the desert, 
Megan hears her father talking about the hotel. This is where John and Megan got married. Not Megan. Megan's John. John and Cindy. No, no stand-up comedy. All right. This is the same hotel where John and Cindy got married, May 17, 1980. It's their happy place. God willing, someone says. An old man starts choking on a pig and blanket, and the room falls silent except for the television. Just as a burly man gets behind him and is about to give the big squeeze, the old man coughs it up on his own. Well, we all know where this is heading, someone says. It's like watching an accident. Are you sure? Something's very wrong. Well, a lot of things are very wrong. Well, it's on us, someone says. We took our eye off the ball. It's her, someone else says. He never should have picked her. She's an idiot. Do you think he talked to her before he picked her? Well, if he didn't, he's an idiot. Well, somebody talked to her, but I think they forgot to ask the important questions, like, do you own your own clothes? Or what's the view from your kitchen window? I can see Russia from here, someone says. Do you remember when Cindy had the drug problem? She handled it so gracefully. I hear John's a gambler, a superstitious guy. My friend knew him in the Navy and said he had a lucky charm he carried with him, a rock. Feather, someone chimes in. He keeps a feather. The staff went mental when he lost it on the campaign trail. Really? He lost his lucky feather? Did they find it? No idea. A cloud of Secret Service agents sweep into the room, and just their physical volume pushes the crowd back against the wall. As Cindy and John enter, the crowd breaks into applause. I'm so glad to see all of you, John says. Cindy and I just wanted to stop by and thank you for the hard work you've done to make the campaign a strong one and for sticking with me through the unexpected ups and downs. There's a brief pause. How's it looking, someone shouts. McCain shakes his head. Well, right now I wouldn't want to be me, he chuckles painfully. Someone is hissing like a, a low rattlesnake. The hissing builds, and it's more than one person, and Megan is shocked. Then the hissing is overpowered by, powered by booing, and she can't tell if they're booing McCain or the people hissing. Don't be a loser, someone next to her says. The man's wife smacks him hard. Shut up, you're drunk. We love you, John, someone else shouts. Don't quit now. With nothing left to say, John McCain raises his arm as far as he can, makes a gesture somewhere between a salute and a send-off, and they are quickly out of the room, enveloped by the Secret Service. Hopefully no one will remember you, the wife of the drunk man says. Oh, I'm the least of his problems, the man says. I'm surprised he can come in here and seem normal enough. What should he do? Start crying? He's got to put a good face on it. Who knows what he's doing upstairs? Smashing stuff. That's what I'd be doing, the man says. I'd be throwing the sofa through the fucking window. That's it, the wife says. I warned you. We're leaving. Say nighty-night to your friends. And I'll just leave that there. And that's the, yeah. Thank you. So I know Margo and I are going to talk about a bunch of things, but I wanted to say it is interesting and, and somewhat unnerving because when I wrote this book, I was finished, I wanted it to come out before the last election, so last November, and the publishing cycle takes a year. And the Forever Men and their activities foretell something akin to January 6th. And then January 6th happened, and as happens in the literary world, people call me and go, aren't you glad it didn't come out? You'd be in big trouble now. Um, and I have to say, it felt really, really scary. It felt scary to have sort of predicted that kind of an art could happen and that there could be people whose intentions were other than the preservation of, of democracy in its, in its most conventional sense, I don't know. So I'm looking forward to, we're gonna talk about that, I think, and some other things. And I just wanna say, again, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna step off this carefully and go, well, careful, I will be careful. Thank you so much. Whatever. Uh, whichever, exactly. I think you would make, make an excellent stand-up comedian, actually. What a pity that women can't be uh, stand-up comedians. <laughs> well, there's, you know, there's always time, one hopes. But oh, yeah. I don't, it, it got pretty weird, the stand-up comedy. But I will say, you know, I forgot to say this, so we can talk as a, as a thing. So the book is very funny, and all of the material I write is funny, and that's not just because I'm interested in being a comedian, I feel like humor is incredibly important because it breaks the surface tension. And breaking that surface tension then allows us to talk about things that are more serious. Um, and I think, in general, the times that we've been living in have been so challenging on every level that 
we have to laugh. Um, and it's, every time when I go to therapy, the therapist, if I'm, if I'm not funny, she goes, I'm worried about you, you're not funny. And I think, I'm not, I'm paying you, right? It's not like, you know. Um, and then the last time she said, I don't feel like I helped you. And I thought, it's not a one-time thing. Like, this is an ongoing situation, I thought. So it was sort of weird. And she said also that she didn't think people wanted to read anything that was serious. I was like, thanks, that's $300. You know? Anyway. Hello. Hi. Um, actually, I didn't have the opportunity to read your lecture before, but I read, of course, uh, a lot of what you just read out loud. And I thought, while I was listening to you, in fact, all her stories about, are about power relations. They're about power, not only between men and women, but let's, let's stick to the, let's start with the real doll, for instance. There is a power relation there, because the young boy is playing with his Barbie, and yes. in, in a way he's playing with his sister, and in a way he's playing with all the women he might uh, encounter later on. Is this a very strange thought? I mean, yeah. if, if we say, if we have a look at the second part, um, the right, had, do we have to write to write about the Holocaust? Mm -hmm. Also, there is a power relation there. What can a writer do? What is the writer allowed to do? Who tells the story has the power, right. isn't it? Right. And the third one, um, the unfolding, of course, it's all about power. Right. It's all Absolutely. about white men who are losing control. Isn't power, uh, it struck me tonight, isn't power the big theme of yours, finally? In, I, I never in... thought about it until you said that, but I think there's, there's something very truthful about that, and that, that throughout all of our exchanges, there are elements of hierarchy and power, and I think that, you know, the struggle for women, forget to even have power, but just to have equality or autonomy in their own lives, is still very much ongoing. And so that, that's definitely there. Yeah. yeah, because you wrote this story in 96, I think. Yeah. Well, what, what changed in these 30 years? I think the story is... We have is... less rights. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, I know. It's, it is disturbing. Um, and it's the kind of thing, you know, it's funny to say, when I was a younger writer, I, I grew up, I would say, very much enamored by the male writers in America who wrote, you know, the big American novels, and John Cheever, and. Um, Richard Yates and all talking about sort of the American dream and so on. And I would never have in any way described myself as a feminist. And, but Grace Paley, who was this wonderful writer, was a feminist who also truly loved men. And I would say it's pretty clear, despite the power problems, I do adore these crazy men very much. But it is interesting because that dynamic in many ways still hasn't changed in terms of money, in terms of jobs, in terms of expectations even in society. And so I was surprised when my daughter, who's now 19, came home, and she was little. She was like, in, you know, like probably nine or 10 years old, and she goes, Mom, were there any women in history? And I thought, uh-oh, you know. Like it, and this was in a very progressive school in New York City, and I thought, wow, how is that what's coming across? Um, so I just said no. <laughs> Never, no. <laughs> I was working. No, I said, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, but it was really interesting. And then I had similarly one of my students, right around the same time, said, came in in that way that only you know, young people can. They go, were there any women writing in the 20th century? This is at Princeton. And I said, you know, what's making you ask that? And she showed me her reading list, and it was all an American 20th century fiction class, all male writers, so the last writer was Toni Morrison. And so I wrote a long list, and I said, please just pass this back to your professor, with my regards. <laughs> Well, we can laugh about this, but of course it's not really funny. No, no. So we're very lucky to have you here, and <laughs> exactly. you should give us a list as well, and yeah. we'll pass it on. Well, wow. There are a lot of wonderful writers. I mean, that's the fun thing too, even I'm sure you've all had that recently, but discovering new writers. We now have Lydia Yuknovich, who's wild, and Melissa Phoebos, who's wild. Um, yeah, and of course Margaret Atwood. And Annie Arnaud. And Annie Arnaud. Yes, and Joyce Carol Oates, who's also in her 80s and just published, I think, her 80th book. Um, yeah, there are, I mean, there are, there are lots of wonderful women writers, and men, obviously. 
I, I, I don't was, want to leave them out. As I, as I go, oh, she didn't mention anything. I, I spoke a little bit about the, uh, the, the, the book ban list in, in the US, yes. which is, of course, very scary as well. I mean, what are they doing over there? Are you on this list, I can imagine, with The, the End of Alice, which is a yeah. terrible novel, terribly good novel, but yeah. at the same time, it's exactly about everything that they are banning at the moment. Yeah, what do you think of that list? Kind of, that book is not on the list. No, no. they don't it even know be. that book. I know, it should be. I'm like, I'd like to add one. <laughs> I'd like to add that one that I could take off something like a, a nice book, like a Toni Morrison book. Um, no, but my very first novel that I wrote when I was 19 has been on that list for a long time, and it's a totally sweet book about a boy named Jack whose dad, his parents are divorced and his dad tells him he's gay. And it's all about Jack's beginning to deal with his own bias and realize that regardless of who his father is going out with, he's still his dad and their family is still his family and so on. And that book has been on that list for, I don't know, 20 years. Still, yeah. Incredible. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that's very disturbing is we, we, meaning people, go to libraries and kids go to libraries to discover things and to read and to, in some ways, sometimes to find themselves or to find their way into another world. And if we suddenly start saying, you're not allowed to look these things up or to librarians, you're not allowed to help a child find something, I, I've never heard of literature causing injury beyond a paper cut. I mean, that's the most you know, profound thing. And, and, and then people say, well, what if they read something they don't understand? Well, the best part is they don't understand it. So it's not, it's not fatal. They're just confused for a while. Well, <laughs> the, problem, I mean. the problem is they will find Jack Nicholson over there, yes. probably. <laughs> yes, yeah. Or The Shining, which is, you know, Jack Nicholson, yes. But I think, I, I think that literature is inherently not dangerous and that we really need to make sure that people have access to information and have access to reading what they want mm. to read. I'm not sure I agree with you because yeah. I hope that literature is very dangerous in some points. Well, you know, I would say in, in the danger is maybe, as I would describe, I could agree with you somewhat. I hope the danger is that it prompts us to think about things we hadn't thought about yeah. and to discuss them. And one of the things that I think is also interesting in America is our system of public education is, is pretty bad now. So we know if a kid is born in some zip code in California, they'll never graduate high school, which to me, that's, that's actually should be criminal that you know that. So one of the things that happens is if, if you're not teaching people to read, to think, to talk, to debate, to argue, then we also have difficulty when we face conflict. And so now we, you know, it's like we, we have really gone back in time and we're resolving conflict by shooting people. I, 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 can't, I can't go there. Um, so I would I think prefer they read a book which is very, very dangerous. Right, but I'd, I, I want to, and even I would say in some ways the reason that these men who are uh, complex and very other than my own way of thinking are in this book is because I want us to be able to practice tolerating what may be uncomfortable and learning how to talk about it, hopefully. And you learn that by reading dangerous yes. books. Yes, exactly. So we should... Uh, we should say read more dangerous books? I yeah. Don't know. yeah. Reading is dangerous and it should be. I mean, reading your books can be very dangerous as well. It can be upsetting. Yeah. And, and, and I would say that's okay. You know, it's even, I mean, the end of Alice, the, the thing that frightens me the most is when someone goes, I love the end of Alice. I'm like, it's about a pedophile. Like, not lovable. That's like the scariest thing anyone could say to me. We have a lot in common. I'm like, no, we don't. Uh, you know, so that's, and then I recently had a bookseller say about the new book, The Unfolding, I found your book difficult. And I wanted to say thank you, but I don't think she meant it as a compliment. But we're at a very modern time when it's not supposed to be difficult. And also then they say, am I supposed to like these people? And again, I would like to say, I don't care because liking a character in literature, do you like the guy in Lolita? Do you like people in Crime and Punishment? That's not what literature is for. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want, you know, it's, we have things to read when you just want to eat candy and that's fine. We all like a little candy sometimes, but. There are some <laughs> writers I, I, I met cavities, over, over right? the last years, I met some yeah. writers who said to me, Oh, I'm writing to make order out of chaos. Good luck. <laughs> I have the impression that in your case, it's the other way around. You show us the chaos right. because the world yeah. is like this. You, you said in your first story, a second sentence, 
um, literaries is kind of a mirror. Yes. Is it? Is it? Yeah. I mean, you, you are showing us the, the chaos you are watching around you. Absolutely, and I'm, 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 I think often what I'm doing too is, is looking at that space between our public and private selves where I think really all the chaos is. Because on the one hand, we try to hide it sort of and there's a lot of internal conflict. But yeah, I, I'm just the col I just color in the chaos. <laughs> yeah. Because Brightly. you think it's more interesting than coloring the order? No, I think it's because I feel a peculiar obligation to see things. I, I, I have like the opposite of, you know, people have denial. I have like an overabundance of staring. Um, you know, I feel like if there are things going on in the world, we need to pay attention to them and notice what's happening. Because I, I know we all, I mean, it's been, we've all been through like a crazy couple of years and feel overwhelmed and exhausted, but I feel like we still have to keep looking at the world around us because there are, unfortunately, now it sounds like a superhero thing, complex forces that are working against us. Um, oh dear, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna rip open my shirt and a big S will be there. I don't know what it spells though. You know, silly. And then I was like, oh, never mind. <laughs> what struck me in the piece you read f out of Days of All about the, uh, the Holocaust story, mm -hmm. let's say that, it wasn't really the Holocaust story that struck me. It was the sentence. Uh, I find it interesting that you have to do this, that the therapist pauses. Do what? Undermine yourself. Mm -hmm. sure. Because that is a very interesting sentence because it says something about the women in your books as well. I th well, that's very observant. And yes, I mean, I think, and for me also in that story, so everybody thinks that story is autobiographical. And I purposely structured it that way and made it that way. Mm. Um, so much so that my friends are like, who did you sleep with? And I'm like, nobody, you know, it's a story. Um, and they're even like, they have names. They're like, well, I'm not gonna tell you who, but and, and, whatever. And um, I think that is true. I think that, I mean, I'm sure there are ways in which I undermine myself and, and probably even my being funny sometimes is a way of undermining myself. Um, I but didn't I ask you if it was autobiographical. No, it, it's not, but I think it's interesting because I do think a lot about, like I think of how women play tennis. To me, this is, and this is not meant as comedy, but it is. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Men don't play tennis like that. Every time women hit the ball, they apologize. Yeah, true. I know, but it's true, like, isn't that? Yeah, absolutely right. true. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, there are things that, that we have to work out and take ownership of, but it's really difficult. Yeah, know? what do you think of people, uh, women who are invited to television shows, and they say always, oh, no, I'm not the expert, and you should ask right. him. Right. That's terrible. Yeah. We should really teach women to say yes, even if they are not an expert. Yes. And Don't I, you agree? Yeah, well, and uh, yes, because the men aren't necessarily experts either. I mean, it, you know, it's about practicing occupying space, but it's complicated because the other thing that does happen, and this is why people are like, why is the big guy called the big guy? Yeah. And it's because the world is filled with big guys, and a big guy is just the person who is... Whether what out, whatever their actual physical size is irrelevant, they occupy more space and they move through the world as though literally things should happen for them. And we all know people like that. And then I have this new bad habit where like if, and I, this is not gonna work out well for me in the end, I'm sure, because if some guy gets in front of me, I'm just like, excuse me, was I invisible? And they just look at me like, yep. You know? and, I'm just like, and then I'm like, I'm, I'm like sort of like a mean, hostile, you know, whatever person. I go, I just look like somebody's mom, but I'm really mad. You know, so I don't know. It doesn't, it's, I'm going to get punched at some point. I just know it. <laughs> I'm like, you punched someone's mom. Don't you feel bad now? You know, they're like, nope. You know? <laughs> so, I don't just know. play a good piece of tennis no. then. I know. Sorry. No. <laughs> you know, they'll, he'll punch me and I'll apologize. Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to speak a little bit about your new book, of course, yeah. The Unfolding. Um, as I said earlier, I think it's a very political novel. Um, in your oeuvre, the political is intimate, and the intimate is political. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I would say what's become increasingly clear is a couple things. So one, when I was looking at this book, I was thinking about the great American novel, which I won't even go so far to call it the great American no novel. I'll call it a pretty good big book, but men call it the great American novel. And that is the large socio-political story, and it is 
99% of the time, with the exception of Toni Morrison, <laughs> written by men. And then there is the, the story that women are supposed to write, which is the small, intimate, domestic story. And it's interesting because certainly in other countries, like I look at Hilary Mantel's work and so many wonderful writers from Europe and much older countries, there isn't that same sense of you should write this or you shouldn't write that. And actually a wonderful male writer said to me the other day, why can't women write the great American novel? And I said, well, part of it is that women didn't work in the first part of the 20th century. And if they worked at all, they worked until they were married. And then they were, it was illegal for them to work. And when they worked, if they worked in publishing, they were typists, they were editors. So they didn't have the great American experience. And in fact, if anyone remembers, Richard Nixon was against women being in the workforce. And you could do a really gnarly thing and draw a line from women entering the workforce in mass to Me Too, and you could actually blame it on the women if you wanted to look at it from that point of view. Because, right. You can always well, you can do anything. blame anything right. on That's, the women. Exactly. Yeah. But I think it's interesting. So that was very much for me. I wanted to create a book that was a weave of the large-scale socio-political book and the intimate domestic that was neither exclusively male nor female in the story. I don't know if that answers your question. You, you talked a little bit about Big Guy earlier yeah. on. Um, Big Guy is actually the center of these forever men. For those who haven't read yet your book, it's it just has not came been out. Right. Just <laughs> came out. Could, you, could you characterize a little bit Big Guy for us? Sure, so the Big Guy is a man who is very wealthy. Um, he, he, so he, he, when he's upset that Obama has won, he pulls together a group of men that, he, that they ultimately call themselves the Forever Men. And that was modeled on a group of men that Dwight Eisenhower as president top secretly picked 10 men in the country and said in case of nuclear war, you are now in charge of banking, agriculture, health care. And he just sent them each a letter that said, in case of nuclear war, I've been authorized to run the economy. Um, and it was top secret till maybe 15 years ago. And so I wanted the men that this, the big guy picks to echo that because I wanted them to talk about the ways in which their sort of different departments, the military, banking, health care, can begin to do what's happening, which is spinning, I wouldn't even call it, it's not information and it's not news, it's narrative. And the idea that there is so much story being propelled out into the world that comes from think tanks, lobbyists, groups that have nice names like people who want to live forever, <laughs> you know, or they like, I give them money, you know. Um, and so they're, they're really about how do they disseminate these ideas in a way that never is traceable back to them. And you notice when people marched on the Capitol, it wasn't wealthy people who marched on the Capitol. It was essentially foot soldiers who'd been sort of indoctrinated into this narrative and into the idea that they had to take back their America urgently. So the big guy and his friends are really setting about the plan that causes that to happen. Um, and I worry that that, I mean, you were talking about that, that that is happening. I mean, we know that it's happening. And then the question is, when you ha live in a society where suddenly there are people who can deny an election, who are now running for office. So if an election denier wins an election in November, yeah. do they win? Or hmm. what happens? Mystery? Right? Yeah. So there's all of these very complicated things. And I think the other piece of it is, when you live in a world where there are phrases like alternate facts that people think that's actually possible, it's not. There are things like sun coming up, fact. You know, Kellyanne Conway, not fact. <laughs> so it's, it's a very complicated time and it preys upon people who feel that the country hasn't fundamentally let them down. And I understand that. I believe that the country actually has yeah. fundamentally let many people down. And you show us that actually it started already in this night yeah. of the election of President Obama in 2008. Um, why did you start your story then and there? Right. Because in a way we could read it as a very as a story of nowadays. It, absolutely. Um, Frightling, frighteningly enough. I know, no, yeah. it's absolutely equally of now. Because I felt that Obama's election really did trip off this reaction. And it's sort of, for, for people who already feared that they were losing their place in America, 
some of them felt that this proved that. And now we have all these people who believe there's a replacement theory. So the idea that immigrants will come into the country and replace them. And I think, how is that going to happen? Because I, I, it's not... So I think one of the... I mean, I look at it and I think, I guess I, I should have maybe become a politician instead of a novelist, because clearly they're the same thing. But... <laughs> That was a, a, st a stand-up no. comedian, maybe, <laughs> exactly. and a politician. Yeah. But the idea too that that you know every we, are, we have very short campaign cycles, so people are running constantly on two-year and four-year platforms. And you look at that, and there are other countries like China that has a hundred-year vision, or Native American cultures that have seventy years, and so on. So they spend all this money every two and four years, and go around all over the country spending money and looking at communities, and they go there's no jobs here, there's a lot of drug abuse here. Okay, that's lovely, bye. And I think, why don't you actually think about what jobs we could bring to that? Why don't we actually do things as we're doing that process? Because the information is constantly being gathered but not used. So that's the kind of thing that irritates me. And I think there are so many people, I mean, I love my country, although I'm not sure what that means anymore because it's a complicated thing. We also like our flag, now belongs to one side, which makes you think it's a bad yeah. kid's football game. Yeah. Like, they yeah. got the flag. Um, do we take part of it? Do we get a new one? What do we do? So, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's funny, not funny, because it's really, it's genuinely, I would say, I, as a kid, I remember my parents saying, if Nixon wins again, we're going to Canada. And I was like, okay, <laughs> get your bags ready. Um, I don't know what happened. I mean, if, if Trump goes back into office, we all lose. I mean, literally, globally. That's the other piece of this. It's a little bit threaded through there. What you show in yeah. your novel is what I find really interesting is that you show, in a way, how, how it is possible that truth, freedom, and democracy mean so different things to various people, because right. they're not... I mean, they're, the, the forever men are freaks. They're very yes, dangerous people. Yeah. Well, let's be, let's be, uh, I mean, it's a joke, but it's really right, serious. Right, but it's not, yes. It's, yeah, it's a joke, but it's not a joke. Right. So they, they are very serious people, and they live in a different world from most of the, uh, as you said earlier, they lose yes. contact with the average American. Absolutely. And how is this possible, that the truth, the words truth, freedom, and democracy mean opposite things nowadays in America? I think, and even right. some, for some people here, of course. Because I think part of it is the spinning of language. And, you know, it, we all talk also about these algorithms. Have you ever noticed, like, that your shoes are wearing out, but suddenly you start getting ads for shoes, and you're like, how do you know about my shoe? And it's like, well, you bought shoe repair stuff on Wednesday on Amazon, and all of a sudden, the whole world knows your shoes are, like, falling apart. It, it's not, a, I mean, it's not a joke. It is true. And so I think, you know... In the book, they say, like, don't use the word power, use the word freedom. So the way in which political spin doctors have taken language and allow it to mean different things. So when someone says, I'm pro-democracy, it's like, well, who's democracy? Um, you know, and they're absolutely, I mean, there's, we know that they're actively people who do not want everyone who is eligible to vote to vote. That's, that's always been part of the system. But and they're working on that really now. Oh, act yeah. actively. I mean, yeah. So that's all. I mean, it, it falls into the super scary category. And I'll say, you know, I, I purposely pushed the Forever Men out further than any of the other characters because I wanted them to be both satirical and surrealistic and a little bit like Dr. Strangelove, like really out there. And every time I pushed them out a little further, I would just look back and reality was like galloping right up to me. So they're not actually very far at all from where we are, by any means. And then yeah. there is this dark money coming into yes. your novel. Yeah. I mean, this is a reality also. Yeah. These people, they have lots of money. They are rich and rich and richer. Yeah. And they have power. They have military people around them. They, they are planning, in a way, a coup d'etat, just like Fukuyama said in this TV show. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> If yeah. this is real. It's 100% real. And there absolutely are, you know, so there's this crazy general in the book. But there are, we, you know, we outsource war. We have private military contractors both working in the United States and outside. And the deal with that is 
If you have private military contractors, they don't even have to abide by the conventions of war because they're private contractors. You always hear on the news, like, a private contractor was killed. The person wasn't doing typing somewhere. These are, these are soldiers for hire. Um, so there's, I would say the book is also really filled with enormous amounts of history, and that was both fun and the history is used, um, how do I say this? I don't take history and bend it or distort it. I mean, they have fictional characters who are in relation to it, along the lines of like how Don DeLillo in, in, in different books has worked with the combinations of fact and fiction, but I really wanted to look at the arc of American history, basically from the end of World War II to now, which was what we talk about, the rise of the military-industrial complex, which is part of that shift in the economy that has just exponentially grown. And I, I think about how 2008 was also this financial crisis. And at that moment, we began to realize how global our finances are, right? And, and now we've all noticed that, oh, when something happens somewhere, we're all affected. It was shocking to me then that the money guys didn't know that when it happened. They're like, well, it turns out we've got problems here. We are now also totally militarily entwined globally. And that is super duper scary. Yeah. And there, it's all economic and it's all big scary toys and there is not a good way to deal Have, with that. Having been listening to you all evening. Everyone's like, and, wow, and, that was the worst and, and reading the, I ever went to. And, and <laughs> think, yeah. yeah. And thinking of the title yeah. you gave your, your lecture, The Role of the Writer, Witness or Commentator, I think there are lots more of roles than just yes. witness or just a commentator. What would, would, I mean, you're a participator, an observer, uh, an activist, what not? Stand-up comedian? Oh, probably not that. Yeah. Um, well, no, no, there are what, lots what of What would roles. it be if you had right. to choose one? I would just stick with novelist, I think. That's not the, the, the I know, opportunity. I know. Um, okay. Witness, I'll go for, wit I'll take witness for a hundred, and then I can go into that special program where they protect you. you know, <laughs> they'll change my identity. Uh, my last question. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, my last question is about the women in your latest mm -hmm. novel, and especially about the young woman, right. Megan, um, because she is the one who gives us hope in your book. She is the young generation, and of course, she learns in in the novel that well, she knows her father, she loves her mother, she she learns about her. Uh, adoption mm -hmm. uh, in the book somewhere, and um, well, she's a little bit disillusioned. She's got a problem, but she has a horse, and well, I mean, her life continues. She's going to vote, and she mm -hmm. she observes her father, who is losing control. She's observing her mother, who is an alcoholic. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, but she's not breaking down. Right. At a certain moment, she says, well, I want to play a part in it. I want to make history. I want to live in history and to be the history of the future. Wow. Yeah. So Megan, I mean, I felt like it was very important for there also to be hope because I don't know what we do. I mean, I can make lots of jokes, but if there's not hope, I'm pretty scared. Um, and there is a moment where Megan is... is bonding with her father and they're at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. And she says to him, you know, is there anything else that you wish you'd done with your life? Is there anything else you wish you'd invented? And he goes, yeah, I wish I'd invented the atomic bomb. And he says that happily. And I think, to me, that is the demonstration of the size of his ego and his insanity, right? Because who walks around saying, I wished I invented the atomic bomb? It's crazy. And we know, you know, Alfred Nobel created the Nobel Prize because he felt upset about having invented dynamite. So this is just the exponential version. And the big guy does have some awakening of how what he thought was his good care of his family sort of paralyzed them. But even by the end, he, he in his arrogance thinks, wow, I have this great kid. She's just going to follow in my footsteps. And it's like, not necessarily. And so that to me is a very big moment. And Megan's realization too that if you want to, to do something, you have to come forward and you have to participate and you have to find your place in history. Yeah. I thought she, she will be the next president. <laughs> we hope, right? 
Megan for president. Well, and then just as a side note, like all of a sudden we saw Liz Cheney. So Liz Cheney and Dick Cheney is like, you know, the big guy loves Dick Cheney. But all of a sudden Liz Cheney, who has never been a particularly uh, reliable or moderate person, all of a sudden she's standing up for things. And I'm like, go Liz. Um, and that's been pretty interesting to see. And then you think, is Dick Cheney proud of her? I always knew she had it in her. Or is he like, oh, Liz, no, 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 no. You know, you're not, you're not doing what we do. And? Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know the Cheneys. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm interested. I think that that, for me, was really interesting because that is in a similar way a family structure of a very conservative father and this daughter who seemed to be following in the footsteps and now has taken a turn. So I thought, wow. I hope you will be writing the story of Megan in the next novel. What? Yeah. Say what? That was, what was I? You was, should write the story of Megan in your next book. Oh, I know. I know. I'm thinking Good. about that. Yeah. I'm happy I'm that. Mind. A.M. Holmes, thank you very, thank you very so much, much for having been with us. Thank you. For the thank you. <laughs> A.M. Holmes will be signing her books. Ateneum Bookshop is uh, selling all the books, I think, or at least all the translations. And afterwards, on behalf of SPY25, I am inviting you to a drink in the venue itself. So not here, but in the venue next door. Thank you very much. Thank you.